Hey, so this is Misery Loves Company, a weekly um, reading series hosted by MiseryTourism.com, where um, every week we welcome outsider and transgressive writers and, um, I, I don't know, writers and artists, I guess, uh, to present their work. So um, I'm not going to not going to fuck around here, not going to belabor, belabor this. Uh, Gabriel is up first. And Gabriel, you have some uh, new, um, newly written poetry, right? Yeah, let me, let me grab it real quick. Sure. Uh, oh, I've got the link. I think that should work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got two pretty, pretty quick pieces. I should I feel like I should give some uh, some context to the first piece. I one of the weirdest experiences happened to me last week. I um, I broke up with my girlfriend in December. She's uh, ten years my junior, so you know obvious obvious uh, compatibility issues. But um, last week, lo and behold, I'm on Instagram, and there's just a picture of her her whole bare ass, just right, <laughs> right on, you know, no one, no one flag or anything. And it just like, it flipped me out so bad. And I, but then I was, I, I got mad. And then I'm, I'm all like, is this like a dart she's trying to throw at me or, you know, like, and then I, it's just like so many conflicting feelings, like, like, oh, why, why should I be mad? Like, you know, this is, this is a, this is artfully done, I guess, you know, this is a, it's a, woman's body it's a beautiful thing but i just got i i lost my shit so um then i'm all like okay yeah i need to stop making this about me or whatever so um this is called flesh in the ether <clears throat> i saw her image in the ether supple flesh that i once traveled her lifting up her dress exposing what was beneath her what can justify the fatalist response now from the baffled the photo doesn't fade away, decisive as I left her. And I know God her main, I know, and I know God made her this way, but now who will protect her? The frame fully developed, now I can't give her direction because I cannot cease my staring at her searching for my reflection. And got one more. Um, this is sort of, I wrote this a little bit ago. This would probably be my like definitive pandemic poem. Um, it's called Time Out of Hand. Sitting on the porch, waiting for my disability. The mailman drives a Toyota truck so it makes it hard to see whether they're giving or whether they're taking from me. I've got a last sip at the bottom of the bottle that's in front of me. And I'm about to burst, haunted by the ghosts of poverty. If they don't have my money, I must still get up to mark my territory. And I feel a little dizzy. Then I'm relieved. It's only me grieving. Sitting in your Porsche, driving through your land of make-believe. You're going to be a corpse, and you can't take it when you, with you when you leave. Just look at you and all your freedom, now that there's no one left on the streets. How does everyone think they're a professor of anthropology? In times of rumored doom or of absolute uncertainty, I'm already writing my will, yet not offering any apology. The only thing I understand, this time is out of hand. The only thing I can demand, this time, out of my hands. The only thing I can believe, the only gift I can receive, this time, is all out of my hands. Wow, those were great. I really love the way both of those poems conclude. You really do an excellent job of working towards that final, I don't want to say punchline, but it, it's, it's like a vicious sort of punchline, right? It, yeah, yeah. It's a real, um, it's a real, and because both of these poems are kind of like jabbing outward at first and then they become reflexive, right? Or reflective rather. Yeah. I, I think that's really an interesting, like, disarming kind of approach, you know, to have poetry that seems so, like, at first seems so confrontational and so at war with the world in some ways, and then at the end, there's this kind of, like, 
you kind of like collapse into despair and like, you know, self-reflection. I, I don't know. I think they're really, really well structured. Oh, I appreciate that. Definitely. Um, next up is, I have too many tabs. <laughs> uh, next up is John, if he's with us. Um, John, are you? Um, yeah. Um, Great. Yeah. Hey. I wouldn't mind waiting though if somebody else wants to go. Sure, absolutely. Um, if you want, I can have Josh go next and then you. Would that be easier? Yeah, you I know you yeah, just, just kind of got home or just. Yeah, yeah. I just need a minute. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Josh, are you with us? Yeah, let me just uh, start video. Yeah, uh, okay. So just uh, I was going to read something kind of new, kind of old, but then uh, it wasn't really quite ready. So I figured I would actually read something. Um, from uh, the first edition of the Great Lakes Review. Um, it was the first thing I ever got published in 2012, and it was one of the first stories I ever wrote. And then uh, I thought I was really great, and then it took seven years to get another thing published, so <laughs> wasn't expecting that. Um, so I'll just get into it. It's called uh, Faith. Um, <clears throat> Surely I'd hit a new low. The thought occurred to me often, as my lows were many and varied in those days. My Aunt Rosemary was putting me up. She converted her, converted her vanity parlor into a makeshift guest room. But to enjoy this relative luxury of accommodation, I had to feign zealous and unquestioning faith in the Lord. To think me, a worldly young man who'd read Sherwood Anderson, Knut Hampson, and Henry Miller having to concede to such atavism. My aunt wouldn't hear of any nephew of hers turning agnostic or worse yet, atheist. So swindling an old lady out of room and board, eh, I thought, well, no matter. I didn't believe in lying about one's convictions, but I had even less of a belief in going without roof, a roof over my head and food in my stomach. And what food it was. If my life at the time seemed empty and void of substance, my stomach was anything but. I was served great slabs of roast beef, filet mignon, and pork stuffed with fresh crab meat and served with peas, carrots, and mountains of mashed potatoes. I carved a hole in the middle of the golden yellow pile of potatoes on my plate, pouring gravy in the center. I pretended the mound of potatoes was a volcano and that the gravy was lava. I imagined the peas to be the, the readers of best-selling contemporary literature. Then I took a spoonful out of the volcano wall, condemning the, pea, condemning the peas to a molten death. It seemed to taste better that way. I ate voraciously, but dinner at my aunt's wasn't just a time of food to mouths and knives and forks to plates. It was also a time of talk. This talk scared me most. I was afraid my tongue would betray me. This fear was augmented by the presence of my Uncle Saul, a worldly man like myself. When he got me talking, I was liable to say anything. He'd sold bogus stocks in Monte Car Carlo, sought financial backing for a film in the United Arab Emirates, and when exotic destinations no longer appealed to him, sold paper in the city until his retirement three years prior. He was also unparalleled in games of trivia, drawing from a vast but inconsequential pool of knowledge. He'd tell you which two states had only one consonant in their names without pausing to think. How many goals had Gretzky scored in the 93 season? He'd tell you that too. He knew a hell of a lot about nothing. The most impressive thing about him though was his hair. It was an affront to death itself, as thick and full and brown as it had been 55 years ago. Great tufts of it spreaded endlessly from his uncommonly fertile follicles. Dense, coiled, and impossibly curly, the hairline framing his average-sized ears resembled a hedge. Being particularly fixated on my own mortality at the time, his hair stood before me as an age-defying edifice. Sometimes when I spoke to him, I was really addressing the hair. My eyes focused on the area directly above his forehead. Here was someone who was never going to die, not if the hair had anything to say about it. Conversation at the table, uh, dinner table always followed the same pattern. It began innocently enough. We could be talking about a television program on deep sea aquatic life that my uncle and I had watched the night before, or something one of us had read in the paper that day. Then, without warning, my aunt would deem the subject of our discussion an abomination. There was finality evoked in her tone. In her tone, you didn't argue. At such moments, my uncle and I would find something fascinating about the asparagus or whatever it was on our plates at the time, finishing the rest of the meal with downcast eyes. I took to counting my peas, inflicting mortal wounds on them with my fork, naming them beyond recognition for their indiscriminate taste in literature. 
Sometimes my aunt would wait until the conversation had reached a point of spirited debate before passing her final judgment. Other times, the discussion was thwarted at the onset, my aunt giving the conversation only the most cursory listen before confirming that whatever it was, it was certainly abominable, incompatible with the doctrine of the church. After a time, I ate my meals without uttering a word. I hoped my silence would be mistaken for piousness or some deep theological understanding. My aunt seemed satisfied. Oh, my sweet boy, she'd say, piling more potatoes on my plate. My sweetest boy. I spent most of the time away from the dinner table reading. Hunched over my aunt's sewing table that served as my desk, I poured over second-hand editions of all the early Steinbeck novels. Any used bookstore is sure to have innumerable, innumerable copies of them, and around $3 a book, it was all I could afford. My aunt had been slipping me $20 a week until I got on my feet. Within no time, I'd finished all the Steinbeck. I moved on to the French, the Russians, and the Germans. Anything I could get my hands on. One afternoon, while reading Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, a strange noise drifted up, drifted up through the vents to my room. It was faint at first, dreamlike, almost impossible to make out. It was my aunt. She was singing her hymns. I was able to decipher part of a verse. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. I tried to continue reading, but the hymn seemed endless. The rest of the house was silent, and soon my aunt's hymn was all that could be heard. She sang in a piercing falsetto refrain. She was really belting it out. With wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. Next, she gave the hymn of a brado treatment. I was sure the windows were going to shatter. My eardrums were going to burst. I started for the door, grabbing my coat on the way. I let myself out and walked down the driveway. The streets were salt-stained and the air was dry and cold. I liked winter best of all seasons. Your breath billowed out. You could see the life escape you. I walked along a catwalk that divided two complexes of townhomes and headed towards the mall. I made straight for the food court, cutting through a department store on the way. The mannequins were smiling just for me and I was feeling better already. Maybe that's what my aunt was after. A brightly lit room with high ceilings and polished floors. I bought a small coffee from the lone cafe in the mall food court. This left me with $18.73 for the rest of the week. At $20 a week, everything was a simple fraction or a percentage. I took a seat at the far end, the same seat I always sat in. There was a lottery booth to my right. All day long, there was a lineup in front of it, mostly made up of the same four or five people. They'd each buy a scratch ticket, take it back to the last row of seats, scratch at it feverishly with a penny, and return to the lineup for another. By the time the lineup was reduced to one, the first of the earlier customers would have already returned, ready for another chance at the jackpot. The endless shuffle of defeated feet. In all my afternoons spent at the mall, I never once saw any of them win more than the cost of a ticket back. Each of them was just waiting for something to happen, that one break that would change everything. They disgusted me. I picked up Zarathustra where I had left off. I don't know how long I'd been reading uh, for when I had the feeling that somebody was watching me. I looked up. Standing before me was a squat Filipina lady of about 40. She was wearing a black wool cardigan and a modest white blouse. The cardigan seemed to have attracted every ball of lint in the mall. Navy blue slacks neither concealed nor enhanced the lower half of her figure. They were simply clothes that happened to be on her. She wasn't really wearing them the way some people did. She held a Bible tightly under the crook of her arm. I see you're reading something, she said. Well, clearly I was dealing with someone who possessed highly developed skills of observation. I said, yeah. How about reading this if you have the time, she said, extending a pocket-sized booklet towards me. I waved my arms and I shook my head. No thanks, I said. That should have been the end of it, but she had a territorial advantage. I didn't have the option of shutting a front door in her face. She seemed to sense this. She stood her ground. Well, how about I read, how about I read you something from this, she continued, removing the Bible from under her arm. And I said, only, uh, if you let me, only if you let me read something from this, I said, holding up the cover of my book. Have you ever read anything by him? He has some very interesting ideas on God, namely that there isn't one. As soon as she was out of sight, lost among the weekday shoppers and burdened with the sinfulness of the world, I headed for the washroom, locking myself inside. I looked at the mirror above the sink. I searched my face, staring at myself. I wondered, did I look like someone who needed a savior? When I got back to my aunt's, it was already dinner time. My aunt and uncle were seated at the dining room table as I walked in. The places were all set. I looked at my uncle. Something on the empty white plate in front of him had apparently caught his attention. He didn't meet my gaze. I looked to the hair. You're just in time for dinner, my boy, said my aunt. Where did you get off to this afternoon? You left in such a hurry I didn't have a chance to ask. I went to the mall over to the cafe, I said. I hope you covered your neck. This weather's an abomination. 
I haven't seen anything like it in years. Cold and bleak as anything. I didn't say anything, joining my uncle in a study of dinnerware before us. Were you just reading over there? She asked after a pause. I was until I was interrupted. My aunt looked at me inquiringly. While I was reading, I met a believer in the food court, I announced proudly. For my aunt, there were only two kinds of people in the world, believers and everyone else. Lord knows there aren't enough of them in this wicked world, she said. She was the nicest lady, humble too. We had the most interesting discussion, I said. Yes, there were times when you had to put your stomach before your convictions. Besides, we were having black forest cake for dessert. And uh, yeah, that's it. That was great as usual. I really, I'm really becoming more and more fond of like your childhood stories that you've written. Cause you, you read another piece about childhood earlier that I thought was really great. And I think it, maybe it's just because like, I like see so much of my own like early teen years and in, in like the like mix of like that morbid, like obsessive fear of death and that like, the doubt about like the spiritual shit that you've been taught your entire life. I don't know. I it just, I really, something about this one really resonated with me, like on a, maybe on a more personal level than anything else, you know, thought it was great. And of course I, I and I was like, huh, this is a surprisingly un-Canadian story from Josh. And then you slip Wayne Gretzky in there. So you, <laughs> I, you always, <laughs> you always, whenever I start to think you're just like anyone else, you remind me that you're Canadian. <laughs> Well, I was trying to write, like, back then it was, like, there was no technology mention, um, partly because technology wasn't quite, but, you know, the story is still 2010, Tumblr and stuff, so I just, I was just kind of a Luddite, but also I, I had this idea then that, I, I remember George Saunders uh, uh, talking about it, too, he felt like he, to write timeless fiction, you couldn't, you know, refer to technology too much or something, and I, I've, I've learned, I've seen the light since then, but that kind of explains part of it, and but I'm glad you liked it because I do think it's kind of a, a bit different. Like I, I see it kind of fits with the other one you're talking about, but that one was a much more recent one. And even in the title, it has a reference to like Touched by an Angel, a pop culture reference. You know? Yeah, right, um, right. Whereas this one um, is obviously um, quite like uh, sterile in that respect or, or, or whatever. But um, but yeah, thanks. Thanks. Everyone no, for I enjoyed it a lot. Listening it out and uh, hopefully I'll have uh, something new later that I won't have to be going back into my um, archives. But yeah. Thank you, Josh. Um, John, are you ready to roll? Yeah, for sure. I'll go. Um, okay. I'm going to read uh, an abridged piece of this story that came out yesterday on Hobart. Uh, it's called Heidi and Bob. It's a little long and I might fuck up a little, but um, just bear with me. Tonight, Heidi is wondering if there is such a thing as ESP. She is thinking that when you make love, your brain opens and everyone knows what you are thinking and you know what everyone else is thinking. So your husband knows what you are thinking and can control you. Yeah. It doesn't sound like you're doing too well, Heidi's caseworker says. Oh, Heidi says into the phone. I think you should come in, the caseworker says. Okay, Heidi says. Now Heidi is an inpatient. Not much for her to do here. Eat, walk hallways, sleep. Heidi likes to sleep. She is good at it. But Heidi is sleeping too much. The more you sleep, the more you want to sleep, the doctor says, and gives her a motivation medication. All the medicine does is make Heidi worry. Is everyone she loves angry because she will never not be ill? She shuts her eyes and squeezes until she feels her skull. She opens and sees colors. On Valentine's Day, Bob visits. He is learning to do for himself. Laundry, dishes, sloppy joes. Heidi wishes she could cook healthy recipes for Bob, but he says, I'm a meat eater. Anyway, the 99 cents only, only carries canned vegetables. Heidi wonders how she got her mental illness. Mom, dad, mom's mom, God, someone or something else. 
Sometimes Heidi thinks she isn't ill, just susceptible. I don't want to pressure you, her caseworker says, but you need to socialize more. Out of the hospital at home, Heidi's kitten hunts the laser, claws the wall to kill the red dot, runs when the phone rings. You got hired, the caseworker says. Great, Heidi says, and shoots the laser at the floor. Aren't you excited, the caseworker says? Yes, Heidi says. Heidi will have a paycheck and an employee discount. She shops at the store so she knows the layout, where things go, what they cost. The store carries cleaning supplies and Kotex and almost everything. For weeks, Heidi waits to say nine words. Hello and welcome to the 99 cent only store. Bob unloads trucks at the Salvation Army. Lifting furniture is hard on Bob's body, but he wears a brace around his back and belly. Surprise, Bob bought a new love seat, new to them. Gently loved, Bob says. Soon Heidi and Bob are moving out of Bob's dad's house and into their own cottage. Heidi likes the cottage with many windows, but why can't she keep her kitten? On their first night in the cottage, icebergs grow on the meat in the freezer. Heidi and Bob sit on the love seat and watch the Grammys. Bob holds Heidi's hand. Her hand fits in his. Heidi loves Bob. Bob loves Heidi. That is enough, isn't it? Heidi is forced to socialize when her neighbor visits. The neighbor has two children, so the government give her extra. Heidi heard the government used to sterilize people like her and her neighbor. She wonders if they want to do that anymore. The Bible says that women are saved through childbearing. The caseworker says, do you want your children to go through what you've been through? Heidi says, no. But does that mean Heidi won't be saved? Tonight an ambulance took Bob to inpatient. His thoughts were racing themselves because his doctor changed his sleep medication, because Bob has addiction problems and sleep pills are hard on the liver and Bob has problems with his liver. The new medicines overwhelmed Bob. He couldn't put on clothes or shower. He was urinating in a plastic bottle because he couldn't walk to the bathroom and when he tried, he fell. He was going in and out of consciousness, con consciousness. Con consciousness. They were supposed to celebrate Heidi's birthday at the man-made lake. Heidi zones the freezer so her manager thinks it looks organized. Her fingers stick to frozen burritos. What a deal, someone says. What? Heidi turns and sees three women holding Easter eggs. I said, what a deal, three women say, sniff in unison, then wipe wrists across noses and become one woman. When Heidi wakes, the paramedics say, relax. No thanks, Heidi says. She doesn't want to go to the hospital. She wants to become someone who belongs at work. When Bob is released from the hospital, Heidi and Bob walk around the man-made lake. Heidi and Bob enjoy sugar-free candy. Chew slow, the licorice is expensive. On the boardwalk, people move both ways, on skateboards, on rollerblades, on foot. On the lake, people ride pedal boats shaped like swans. Heidi sees ducks, and geese and a pair of real swans too. When it gets dark, the baseball stadium shoots off fireworks. Heidi looks up and watches the sky change colors. Heidi gets dizzy and sits. The electricity goes out in the storm and Bob lights candles. They're having a lot of rain, which is good, he says. So in the summer, we don't have famine. Heidi and Bob try to keep the refrigerator closed, but the icebergs melt. Tonight, Bob was robbed. A street person stole his money with a knife. 
But Heidi doesn't understand why Bob was downtown around the other man-made lake with his paycheck. Bob doesn't want to talk about it. He wants to watch music videos with Heidi on the love seat and not talk. He holds out his hand for her. Heidi likes to clean at night when it's hot weather, but also she is wondering how they will pay rent. The other day, Bob had a procedure called rubber banding. The hemorrhoids are tied with rubber bands to cut off the blood flow. They choke and shrink and die. For some reason, Bob couldn't breathe through his nose, so they couldn't give him anesthetic. He had nothing and it hurt. The doctors aren't sure about the knot on Bob's throat. Next week, Bob goes for chemo. Today, the entire outpatient group is going to a baseball game. Heidi is happy because Bob is happy. But when they reach the seats, Bob says, it's nosebleeds. Heidi squints to see the men on the diamond. Instead of the game, Heidi watches seagulls land in the stands and fight for her bun and dog. Heidi didn't know they were meat eaters. There won't be any fireworks, someone says. It's a day game. Heidi tries to visit Bob at the skilled nursing center every day except Sunday because the bus doesn't run. Heidi should go to church on Sunday, but she loves to sleep late. Bob is back from the hospital and acting different. The doctor changed his medication because of the cancer. Now most of Bob's day is spent in the recliner, listening to music loudly and watching videos that don't make Heidi happy. So far this year, Heidi and Bob have had three Thanksgivings at group, at the Salvation Army, and a private dinner in the cottage. Tonight, they're having another dinner with Bob's sister and her husband at Sizzler. Bob's sister owns a house in Texas, but her tenants don't pay rent. She says if Heidi and Bob move to Texas and pay rent for five years, they can own the home. Heidi and Bob decorate the cottage for Christmas. Outpatient group has a Christmas party. And in a raffle, Heidi wins a wallet, but the wallet is empty. Heidi and Bob are spending New Year's at the neighbors. Champagne pops. Bob smokes pot with the neighbor's boyfriend. Someone says, rent is going up in the new year. No one could afford it, but they all have to. Heidi is cozy at the cottage window watching rain fall. In the living room, Bob is watching his porno videos. At work, Heidi gets dizzy. She sits in the aisle of the canned goods and the shoppers shop around her. Her manager says, I need to see you in my office, okay? Heidi still has sizzler hidden in her teeth. Her pointer finger picks at the steak. She will own her own home. Okay, I'm sorry, the manager says, but we have to let you go. Okay, Heidi says. Where? In the hospital, in the x-rays, Heidi's intestines are completely stopped up. Some psych meds do that. Now she is drinking plenty of water instead of Diet Mountain Dew. The doctor says the dizziness could also be caused by stress. Luckily, there is the man-made lake. Heidi and Bob a walk around in the evening. She gets to see all the ducks and geese who live there, but no more swans. Tonight, Bob wanted money for meth and Heidi wouldn't give it to him. There was only a little left over for laundry, bus fare, and whatever else. They were in the courtyard of the cottages, so the neighbor heard Bob hurting Heidi. I'm calling the cops, neighbor yelled through the screen. Now Heidi is here in the shelter for women. She wonders where Bob is and how he will get his nighttime medicine. Heidi knows it was a long time ago that her dad called her brain donor, dummy and jerk, but it affected her. So when Bob talked about he was neglected in his youth, 
Heidi understood. But Bob admitted to Heidi that he had had prostitutes give him oral sex. Bob borrowed the money from Heidi and didn't even bother to pay her back. And when Heidi was an inpatient, the only time Bob came to see her was when he wanted money for meth, but Heidi didn't know that at the time. When they had sex, sometimes it hurt and Bob would say, no, it doesn't. Bob would constantly watch his videos and try to get Heidi interested. Bob was constantly masturbating and when Heidi told him to see a doctor, he refused. Bob blamed all the problems in his previous marriages on his wives and Heidi is sure she, he will blame her too. But Bob did help when Heidi was homeless. After they met an inpatient, Bob brought her to live at his dad's. But Bob constantly got on Heidi the way her dad did. Now Heidi's new apartment isn't walkable to the man-made lake. Heidi is reading a book that her bus driver recommended called Never Be Sick Again. She likes it so far. Heidi visits Bob in jail. Bob stopped taking his medicine, took meth and stabbed a woman in a motel. Now Bob wants a divorce. Today is Sunday, so Heidi walks to church. Although her wardrobe is wanting, her leg is feeling better. She walks with her muscles now instead of her bones. Tomorrow is group. This week they will walk a wildness trail. Today, Bob's dad and brother visited Heidi's new apartment and dropped off the love seat. They said the government offered Bob a plea deal, 13 years, but Bob won't take it. Bob is going to plead insanity. Heidi is on a vegan diet, making an effort to eat less food. She's decided she will no longer drink Diet Mountain Dew or any soda. Soda seems to mess with her memories. Heidi goes bowling with someone from church. Heidi bowls a 70 something. The guy from church is supposed to be a friend but keeps putting his arm around Heidi and asking, are you ticklish? After that night, Heidi doesn't hear from him again and she's glad. Bob gets sentenced to 12 years in prison. Heidi doesn't know how to feel, but wishes someone had asked her opinion. Heidi tries to call her sister another time, another time, another time, but only gets busy signals. Heidi ends up in the hospital too many times and her caseworker moves her into assisted living. The food is sometimes healthy, but everything is always changing. They like to keep you guessing because they want you to learn to cope. But Heidi thinks routine helps mental patients. Heidi's new roommate is helpful. She lets Heidi talk. There is so much to say, but sometimes Heidi still settles on, okay. Her roommate is 86 years old and doesn't remember everyday things, just the past. There are a couple of older ladies like that here. The younger people are all mentally ill. Sometimes Heidi doesn't think she is mentally ill, just unable to defend herself against doctors. In the dining room, they wait for cake. The musician strums his thumb down the strings of his acoustic guitar, lays it on its back in the box and snaps the locks. The ambulance lights change color in different ways on the window. When I was in San Diego, Heidi says, I had a vision that hospitals are gateways to hell. God works through medication, her roommate says, but Heidi isn't sure she believes that. That's the end. Holy shit. That was, that was fucking devastating. <laughs> like that. I love, you were able to evoke so much emotion with such like spare minimalistic prose. It, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Like how much work, how much like emotional work each word does in that story. It was like, holy, it, it is spectacular. Like I, 
I'm really fucking sad right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that that was fantastic. Thank you, John. Thank you, guys. Um, next up, uh, Rudy, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. So, um, you, since this piece is not published yet, but going up on the site, um, going up on Misery Tourism rather, uh, next month, you probably don't want me to post the link out on Twitter, but you want me to put it in the, uh, in the chat here for you? Uh, yeah, sure. I can, uh, I, I may actually, let me link it actually again. Shoot, I just dropped it. Okay. Oh, sorry. I think that link's good though. Um, okay. Okay. Everybody should be able to see that one. Do you, um, uh, this? want to give a little context about this before you read or just yeah for me to ask about, <laughs> about <laughs> after okay sure so this one is about a um it's about wesley willis it's it's a kind of like auto fiction wesley willis thing i don't know what it is um but uh there is a review linked in the piece um it's by stephen thomas Earlwine of all music uh, it's basically a review where he talks about uh willis one of willis's albums uh wesley willis being an outsider musician guy uh some people probably heard of him um but he basically says that uh in the review he says a lot of things that i thought were kind of dumb um <laughs> one of which uh was that basically willis's work he, he kind of brushes it off in a way uh that i thought was stupid by saying like it was above criticism because of his well schizophrenia basically um but if you read the review I don't know. I, I don't really know what to say about about that. But uh, I will read it, and then uh, maybe we can talk after that. We Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Wesley Willis was a big black buck. He looked like the type of nigga get a rape charge. He looked like the type of nigga get his ass beat by Batman. Batman was a billionaire libertarian who got off beating homeless people and the mentally ill. He was a fucking asshole in the first place. Batman beat Wesley Willis up and put him in Arkham Asylum. He was locked in there for 300 days. A lady doctor evaluated him. She wore too much makeup on and off the job. You're a goon and a clown, Wesley said. You're an adult man with chronic schizophrenia, she said. He masturbated to her feet and shoes later that night. He was heavily medicated and couldn't come. Batman whooped Wesley's ass. Xanax whooped Wesley's ass. Risper doll whooped Wesley's ass. The fire and forget bandwagon battle cry of get therapy whooped Wesley's ass. Zoloff whooped Wesley's ass. Wesley whooped Wesley's ass. Wesley was fucked in the ass by 50 killjoys on Reddit. He was fucked 25 times by disability ethicists. He was also fucked 37 times by reviewers with a humanist bent over a wheelbarrow. And 11 more times in a random Quora question. He was fucked in the ass by a knight of the Ku Klux Klan dressed as a critic of outsider arts uncomfortable relationship with queer bi POC artists. His ass was a bit ruptured. His genes predisposed him to getting ass rammed. Wesley, 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 the uncriticizable, friendly spook. Wesley was fucked in the ass brutally, and the 50 killjoy semen was pissed away into anal cavity, creating nothing. He was up to his eyes in killjoy jollies. They were so full of shit, he had to come. This guy really shot a load, and so someone said about his legacy. And he took his own foreskin and mutilated it to create accessible art. Wesley, 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 Wesley the uncriticizable, friendly spook. Wesley was taken to a hospital by police car. At the hospital, he told the clinical therapist crisis worker to say something useful. After the clinical therapist crisis worker said something useful, 
He got on top of Wesley and told him to levitate with mindfulness techniques. So far, Wesley was diagnosed by using the DSM like the Eye King and became goose for super duper drug stupor maneuvers. Honk. Wesley, 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 Wesley the uncriticizable, Wesley the uncriticizable, Wesley the uncriticizable, Wesley the uncriticizable, friendly spook. Rock over London, rock on Chicago. As I prex a five at five. Sleep well, sweet prince. And that's about it. <laughs> Holy shit. First of all, impression on point. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have two questions to ask about or, or two questions to ask, two things to say, whatever. First first of all, like this is on we had a conversation about this piece before oh. and you actually, this is actually like heavily based on two of Wesley Willis's actual yes. songs, right? Yep. And I was going to mention that, uh, basically these are, these are based on the Batman, I whoop Batman's ass, one of his uh, more famous ones, but also Casper, the homosexual friendly ghost is the second one. Some of these lines are actually verbatim from his, uh, his work, like, uh, the ruptured, his ass was kind of ruptured. That's actually from, uh, from his song, obviously, Batman whooped his ass. That's from the song. But yeah, these are all, it's all very inspired by his work. I tried to get the cadence and the, you know, kind of the impression right. Uh, not sure I quite pulled it off, but. No, you no, did a I, great job. Like, <laughs> I, I actually listened to a couple of those tracks when you were um, talking to me about the piece earlier, and you really nailed the impression. Now, my second question is this, and this question is, is more to give you a chance to talk about this topic because I think I know the answer, but do you feel any um, any kinship to Wesley Willis? Is there some piece of you that's like... Absolutely working? not. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, just the way the review is written... I don't know. I don't want to talk too much about the review because it's really very short and very, um, it's very typical of most like music reviews, I think, and that, you know, it tries to court some kind of controversy question mark, but also like make the guy seem more insightful than he is. Um, but basically I really don't. And I said this in the, uh, in the Skype chat, I think when I put it in there, I don't really like things that kind of brush people off because of their brush brush the like people off as far as art critique goes because of mental illness and i think that that's something i've seen kind of applied to some of my work um and it's uncomfortable it's dumb and uh like willis obviously was schizophrenic and and it's like token and informed. Too, it's tokenism right? too yeah. and the way like he was i mean obviously like, I guess he was kind of similar to Daniel Johnston in the way um, his work was received. You know, some people, you know, laughing at it and like, hey, you know, that's that's that, this big black dude up there saying shit and like going out of his mind. And like, we kind of think that's funny. Um, and that's cool. I mean, that's great, honestly. Like, I, I don't care. I mean, I would, I mean, um, but I think there's a personal side of it. Obviously, I mean, there's personal side of everybody's work but there's the, the personal stuff I don't think you can really brush off um, either um, and to say that it, he's basically above criticism that's like an insult that's basically saying I'm not going to engage with your work because you're a schizophrenic weirdo um, and that was the main thing that set me off and um, made me inspired me to kind of write this was that idea of just brushing work off because it's weird or because it's it's like well I can't engage with that because I'm not you basically which is useless so yeah, yeah right and it's more offensive on some level than just like outright criticizing someone's work right like saying oh well because you suffer with mental illness or because you're black or because you happen to be black and suffer from mental <laughs> illness, like i'm not going to touch this like as opposed to being like I don't know, that kind of sucked. or Like that at least. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I mean, once, at least that you can answer, but that kind of like perspective that like on the one hand tokenizes you and on the other hand yeah. like diminishes you and reduces you to whatever the fuck like you are minus your art is really like that stuff. <laughs> that skin crawl shit, you know? Definitely, yeah. 
It's fixed pan. I have, I, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm still, I'm thinking about the delivery and that was fucking, that was great. I'm going to have to, you're going to have to do more pieces in the voices of other, um, famous or like infamous personalities. I, I want to hear more of this. Uh, yeah. Thanks, man. Um, so while, while you were reading, um, Graham sent me a message saying that he wanted to read. Um, are you with us, Graham? Yeah, I'm right here. Cool. <clears throat> so um, also, if anyone uh, would like to read after Graham, um, just shoot, put a message in the chat and Rudy and I will, um, Rudy and I will see it and, uh, and we'll put you on the list to read. So I guess we're kind of half in open mic now, half, <laughs> whatever. Uh, anyway, Graham, it's, it's all yours. Okay, is there like, uh, I, I, uh, can I do like two poems? Oh yeah, sure, absolutely, absolutely. I don't want to like take up too much space. No, no, uh, pretty much all of our scheduled readers have read at this point, so it's all yours. All right, well also mm. sorry for, for missing most of it. I saw, I saw John, John Reed, I was really excited to see that. I, I didn't, I, I, I wasn't really aware that this thing happened. So I'm really happy that you guys always have like an open door policy. Yeah, definitely. We have an, basically we have scheduled readers and then we have an open mic. So it's kind of everything goes at this point. Uh, do you have a link to the pieces that you want to read? If not, that's fine. But if you did have a link, I could share it, um, share it on Twitter. Oh, uh, no, one of them, shit, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't know it was going to be this fast. Uh, one of them is going to be published in Rejection Lit. Gotcha. Soon, and I'll read that one second. The other one was in the... Um, uh, fuck. Guys, I, guys, everyone, I'm sorry. Where is man? You're all right. Don't worry. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, oh, you're good. Uh, the the core well, This is part of the performance. <laughs> it is, yeah, exactly. This is... This is part of it. The Quarantine 2, uh, Zach Smith's uh, like zine that he put out a couple months ago. This was like a poem that was in it uh, called Cynthia Covert. Sure. Sweet. Um, oh, it's all yours. Yeah, okay. I'm going to start. I'm going to start right now. <clears throat> Cynthia Covert. A woman in South Carolina got ate by an alligator after walking out into a pond to take a photo or just get a closer look, even though her friend told her the gator ate a deer a few days ago. The woman said, I don't look like no deer right before it grabbed her and took her away forever. The woman slipped and turned around. She said, I won't be doing this again. And that was it. That was the last thing she ever said. Her friend told the cops she was drunk. She, acted, she hadn't acted right all night. She came over to me to give me a Medicare, then waded out into the water called by the reptilian gods for sacrifice. Her friend had to watch that all with chipped and busted nails and two long cuticles but I can relate right about now. Right about now, I feel drunk enough to live forever. What could possibly kill me? Death doesn't exist. A lung crushing roll would be a break from monotony. Hell, I'd do it just to feel some warm mud between my toes. God bless the reptilian gods. God bless that lovely woman. That's, that's that. And the Tank Museum, it's number two. So I wrote this as a short story, or no, I wrote it as a poem, and then uh, Kevin Stern, I think is his, how you say his last name, uh, was looking for short stories, so I made it into a short story. Uh, but I think it, it's just as unhinged either way. Um, well, who cares? The Tank Museum. I've been dreaming about the Tank Museum in Danville, Virginia. My family review, refuses to go with me to the Tank Museum. But soon when my family goes to the Tank Museum, I will see big boy guns and shoot em up guns and blow em up guns and galleries of blood. I want to spend the day reading the names of the dead. I want to learn how to kill better. I want to buy a t-shirt tie-dyed in commie blood. I want a necklace made of skull fragments. I want to kill someone who doesn't look like me at the Tank Museum. I want to hold bright plastic replicas of death machines. I want to kick my dog in the name of my country. I want tremors and a head wound. I want night terrors. 
I want trauma so there's something to fight. I want a piece of my brain missing. I want a certificate saying I'm good. I want to be an angelic hero. I want my name on the plaque at the tank museum. I want my blown apart face on the wall. I want to feel military fabric against my skin. I want to be sorry for everything I've ever done. I want therapy that doesn't work. I want five bucks an hour cleaning the VFW behind the tank museum. I want a problem with a solution. I want to lose all my leg hair. I want a story I never tell. I want to grow big and fat. I want to, sh I want to shoot them up gun of my own. I want to take control. I want to see my kids again. I want to crochet. I want to crochet a hammock for the VFW behind the tank museum. I want to be tired of the tank museum. I wish the tank museum had weekend workshops. I wish the tank museum was open on Sundays. I wish my church made me feel like the tank museum. I wish the tank museum was my father. I wish the tank museum could give me two kids and a wife. I wish the tank museum could give me honor of any kind. I want to donate my blood to the tank museum. I want to find a new identity at the tank museum. I want the tank museum to be more than the tank museum. I want the tank museum to make me feel like the kind of person who loves the tank museum. I want to be the kind of person who loves the tank museum at the tank museum. I want to look into another human's eyes and know what it means to say tank museum. I want to wake up in the morning with the purpose as certain as the tank museum. I want to be a tank at the tank museum with nowhere else to go at the end of my run rusted in the gravel backyard of the tank museum. I want to be anything as much as the tank museum tank museums. I want to be the G GPS's final destination that brings joy through the exactness of my title. I want to be a room of promises and the people fulfilled by them. I want to be so certainly certain in my thingness I no longer am an individual entity. At the tank museum, there is only tanks and airs, which is the absence of tanks and the no non-tanks enjoying the tanks. When we finally go to the tank museum, I'll get a hat that says tank museum. And when I wear it, I'll think about the tank museum. There is a song playing on the radio in the other room. It reminds me of a time when I loved that song and all I wanted was to know more about songs like it. I woke up early just to listen to that song. Back then, anything could happen. That's it. That's all I got. Oh, wow. Those were fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The, the chat's going wild about the Take Museum one. But no, I mean, that was, first of all, they were both fucking hilarious. But um, I really loved the first one because I, I love poetry that deals unromantically with death. And, and it's just like, the entire premise of like that entire exchange between the woman and the alligator is like at once like totally fucking unromantic totally like refuses to like glorify death or make death seem like it's transcended but on the other hand is like still like deeply beautiful on some level and that was just wonderful and like the tank museum one was a fucking laugh riot that was <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, man. That was fantastic. No problem at all. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah it was, uh, I mean, what William just said is like, uh, not making fun about myself because I really like your work. It was just, um, I, I did a thing, Challenger uh, Shuttle uh, Tragedy, which was very similar to kind of the alligator the, the, the alligator thing. When I, when I read the alligator thing in the quarantine too, I was like, yeah, that was like by far my favorite one in there. And then to hear you read it was, was nice. You know, totally. And I, I think I even sent it to friends who, are, who only read me because they're my friends, not because they read poetry. And, and they also really liked yours. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I also really like the, in the second poem, like, I don't know. I realized actually, as I was putting a manuscript together, that like I had a bunch of poems that had, I want so much in it. And I think it's like an earnest expression of like, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, I like it as a, as a device. Um, also, uh, several women I've dated have said like I, I I want things but I don't actually want to do things and I and I like that that uh, anyways but yeah 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 and I I think I think also like the the litany kind of thing in poetry is maybe easy but also can go I mean I don't know I think it like I, I'm really obsessed with like the re repetition of anything yeah it feels like a way of of um getting uh, uh lost in in whatever it is so like with the, the thing, yeah, just saying tank museum over and over again. I took out a big part where it was like, I think I changed it because I had to like make it into like the frame of a, the character going through that. But in the original version, it just was like the word tank museum, tank, tank, tank for probably as long as the poem was already. 
Um, but then I was like, that uh, is not as satisfying as uh, a sweet, genuine memory. <clears throat> yeah, no, I actually just learned that, that device, I mean, I think unless I'm um, um, misrepresenting it as uh, an Afra, I learned it, uh, a, a rhetorical device, just um, I don't know the definition here, consisting of repeating a sequence of words at the beginnings of neighboring clauses, mm. uh, thereby lending them emphasis. But yeah, I just yeah, I really like that. I like, I mean, when done well, but it can it can go it can go awry. But yeah, this did not. Anyways, thanks for reading. I I like to I like to hear them out uh, out loud after having read uh, one. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, thank you so much, Graham. That was great, and I hope you'll keep coming to these things now. If this was your first one, it was. Yeah, and hell yeah, I'll definitely come back. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so while you were reading, I think Bible sent me a, a message saying he'd like to read. I see you in the participants list. Are you still with us, Bibles? Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. It's all yours. Um, so, um sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, Bibles. Um, was Eric, uh, E or was that, um, I think I saw some, a message from Eric E that said they wanted to read also. Yeah, that was me. All right. Oh, okay. Fine. It doesn't um, doesn't matter to me who. Yeah, Bibles can go first, um, and then I'll go after that. Okay, cool. Okay. I don't have a lot of time anyway, so it, won't, it shouldn't be very long. Okay, it's all yours. Okay. I'm stuck, ingrained in the film. There's no time to write. There's no separation. Bibles is melted into the cement. We were right all along. Our eyes did not deceive us. I must be present. I must dedicate my time to the family. These children are my responsibility. My wife is completely dependent upon me. I'm, from, I'm proving my worth. $70,000 is possible. We could get into the house of our dreams, jumpstart our lag. It's just a starter, but the business could collapse tomorrow. It could collapse before the bookstore. Doesn't matter that it does 10 million a year. We pay that and more in damages. It's not mine to keep. I'm a nuisance. Why are you bringing this to my attention, asked my father. Have you been wasting time all this while? Is there even any reason to replace you? Are you worth anything at all to me? Father, I'm a writer. I'm more important than either you or I am aware. I'm Manuel fucking Marrero, man. Ever heard of me? I'm a Nobel Peace Laureate. I'm good at the game. The personality has melted into me. My Tulpa and I are one. The coin has fused. We are spendable currency now. It's all coming together. The planted talent has sprouted. He's asking if I'm trying to teach him something or if I have an actual question. Both, I reply, or something like that. I have an actual question, something that I'm stuck at. I'm trying to reach you, Father. I'm trying to take your mantle. They hold me in disregard. I'm the father of contemporary literature, Dad. Please, this is part of the script. This is the narrative that we're handling. I have to overtake you. That's what's going on here, right, podcast crew? Right, of course, Bibles, you're the man with the plan. Sequels are for squares. I'm on something like my 10th novel, just plugging away at them, pecking at the progression like a chicken for its worm. I'll get those marquee lights, Dad, I say. Working in this shop with his name on the signal sale. Put your phone away and pay attention to the children, shouts my wife. She doesn't understand this is my big break. Fine, I say. Short, quick burst it is, in hiding, in secret. It's not that the people need my voice, it's that I need them to hear it. I need their attention. It validates my entire existence, babe. I couldn't take on my father without them. I wouldn't be able to be a man myself. The narrative has become my backbone. The spine of the book is the spine of myself. It literally flows through me. It literally controls what I do. It helps me stand tall. It helps me understand my place in this world. It's not all about you, she says. You've had your chance, shot your shot. I'm over here doing the dishes, she continues, while you're out pleasure cruising with your Comstar cult. It's not a Comstar cult, I tell her. They're my friends. They're business partners. We can make real money doing this, babe. I've already recorded an ad. We'll insert it into the next episode. Gary's husband wants the same things you do. He's gay, by the way, Gary and his husband. We all want the same things in life. We're just trying to move up in the world. Art had to be pure, I continue. It won't last if it's not quality. It can't look fake or contrived. It can't serve simply as a money maker. It becomes garbage. The machine fails. Money is a reward from heaven, but if you're not making art, you're making garbage, and nobody likes garbage. The money shouldn't even come directly from the art. 
The art made purely feeds your life, which makes you money. Money is basically life. You can't live without it, despite what everyone says. But I'm not going to be out there ch charging fees to edit. I'm not going to be trying to angle this spiritual act. I want to attain it for the world. Don't bother me in this regard anymore. It just brings me so much closer to ditching you. I'd pay alimony before using my art to beg for money. This whole conversation makes me sick. It's like looking at a sea urchin. You're disgusting me. I wish you never brought this up. You're such a liar, she says. You charge for every second of attention if you were mad enough to pay. You're a pussy. That's why you're poor. I'm not, not on John Bianca's podcast or on Dennis Cooper's blog. You wouldn't have to be in this steel situation if you had balls. You're raising everybody's time. Get over yourself. Act like you're so much purer than everybody. It sounds like these to make me want to walk out. Abandon the children. All my responsibilities. The house hunt, the steel shop, my parents, guns, the drug policy, the Novate policy. What I wouldn't do for a so-called schmick. Let my nuts loose again. It doesn't matter that I talked about the thing on my dick. It was probably just a skin tag. Honestly, nothing's ever popped back up, I swear. I'm as clean as a whistle, and I'm a Scorpio. It's worth it. Everybody is well aware that I got potent sperm. I think a baby's Bibles is an appealing concept. Who wouldn't want their own little Derek crawling around? And I'm knocking on Manny's door. I'm like, knock, knock. The man is free. The soul let loose. You couldn't keep me in prison forever, pulling out my Smith & Wesson and shoot myself on his front porch. I had failed. The family was a good thing. The stress needed to keep my writing desperate. I just wanted to see what he had done, what he had driven me to. I couldn't stand inside. I just couldn't stand not being able to fully let loose. He's the one who wanted a wife and kids. He's the one who wanted people around him to watch movies with. I just wanted to be free, basically, not to exist. Yeah, it's not the salt flats, but there are a lot of places that waste a bullet in that situation. Places that one can kill themselves, I mean. Frankly, I wouldn't waste a bullet in that situation. How dramatic. Sounds like something State Farm Jake would do. I'm more of an out in the middle of nowhere guy. I'm on my flat throne in the throes of darkness, coyotes howling in the distance, the blood seeping into the sand, a statement piece of my personal kind. It's probably how I'm going to do it, especially if I see the dementia really start settling in. Hopefully I'm not too far gone to test my balls because I'm always up for a dare. I just want to go out a legend. I don't want to outwear my welcome. There's so much content. Surely I can simply wash it away and he, away, away in it, yet here I am creating more of it. Y'all should be spending your time with someone else. Who am I kidding? Pretend they're not there. I'm on the salt flats. Cut off all communication. Hand over the podcast to Gary. Just don't forget that I'm the boss, damn it. I could make him the boss or Derek, but he's just a child, a baby boy, a baby boy who loves to read. That's how it's going to be. And I'm watching and forcing myself to pay attention because who doesn't want that from their dad? God, what wouldn't I give? But my dad's too big of a dollar to tackle any of these concepts. He'll let me down out here. I'd let anyone else drown up there. Oh, shit. But anyone that drown, but really, they could all be my children. I give them all of them the attention and love that they are seeking. I don't have the time. This is the real thing. It has to be done. It's got to be a special board. I'm not going to be able to spend that time with myself. That's why you're trying to travel. I understand some of the special breeds. It's a clever trick. I'm not going to tell you well. I may not be giving you the same as you deserve. Or that I want you to just make you uh, jib before it. But that's going to change. You may not be a true prince of shadow and still the changing that you are. But looking at your little face, the direct attention that you pay me, you're aware. I know you are. Look who I'm talking to. For Christ's sakes, you won my heart. I surrender to the children. These fathers in the making. I'm only sorry that I won't be around to see you in that state. Whether I'm dead and rotting or living as such, seeing me now is the true pleasure. The fact that you're accomplishing the feat and idolizing readers' dream is testament to my success. I thank you for that, and I'll love you forever. When you come on the screen, I promise I'll turn it up. I'll look. I'll smile. I won't hold back my laughs. I'll try to find the ways of releasing them. There's always something in it. Someone can make a person smile. I'll find that for you. I know what it's like to be a son. Uh, I'm just, I gotta end it there. Oh my God. Oh my fucking God. The, the whole like lo-fi, like talking into your phone, going in and out quality did so fucking much for that piece on top of your delivery. That was like, that was, <laughs> A real, fu I, I don't know, that was a real fucking moment. That's, this, I think that reading is going to go down with uh, uh, suicide, <laughs> suicide on stream um, story as one of the all time greats in Misery Loves Company. I, I just, everything about that was like, like transporting, you know, it was like an out of body fucking experience. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thanks, guys. Dude, that that was so awesome and like the whole time with like the noise and the um like the ambience i guess it uh i i don't know why i was just thinking of like a speech from like a final fantasy villain or something like that like really like really like with all the 
you know, the ambient stuff like going on around you. And it was just, it made it so powerful, man. It was great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much. Bibles. Um, Eric, it's, um, you're up next. All right. Um, this is the beginning of the first chapter of a story, I guess. Um, I don't really know how to introduce things here. Um, sure. Do you have a I link think, by any chance? Or? Yeah, the, um, the excerpt I'm going to read is about, I think, about 1,500 to 2,000 words long. I'll, it's pretty short. Um, it's for um, a zine coming out. I have a couple of other people have read on it so far called Yonk. Um, so this is one of the stories. It's part of one of the stories that's going to be in it. And um, yeah, all right, I'll just read it. Um, <clears throat> just quickly, do you have Twitter? Just I usually tag our readers in the oh, yeah. tweet thread, so other if people are watching this later, they can follow you or whatever. Uh, oh, okay, it's it, yours is the yeah. scene. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that, Eric. It's all yours. Yeah, no problem. Um, <clears throat> I have waited a long time to tell this story, over a hundred years, and now finally I found you, the perfect reader, the one who may understand the pain I'm about to show you and the fear. The one who will not comment, but will only absorb my words and take what lessons they can. I will attempt to be as unintrusive as possible. Though I'm the one telling it, it is not my story, it is hers. It begins with a triumphant escape from a house in which no one would want to live. Hannah's father paced across the room, wordless, staring at the ground, lit only by a few dying lamps that flickered jagged shadows across his face. Behind his back, he clenched and unclenched a fist. A few times he stopped, looked up at the wall, and opened his mouth as if to speak, then shut it again and resumed his patrol. Hannah wondered if she should repeat herself. The words had hung in the air for a moment before disappearing like a party guest who just realized how awkward her presence was. Now the only things Hannah heard were her father's quiet footsteps and the occasional outside hooting of an owl. She glanced at the suitcase that lay on the floor next to her. One hour ago, she had thrown clothes into it without even bothering to look which ones she was taking, not caring if they matched or were clean or even if she had a full set of anything, until the trunk was so fat that she'd had to kneel in it to close the latches. Inside of it was the rest of her life. This isn't how I would have made my escape, but then again, I'm not Hannah. If I was her and she'd been able to see her life the way I do, with every moment from her past to future neatly arranged before her, well, you wouldn't be here because who wants to read a story with a protagonist who kills herself before the beginning just so she doesn't have to live through it, so she doesn't have to become what she sees. Her father stopped and ran three, uh, three fingertips over the surface of his heavy mahogany desk as gently as he might touch a lover. He brought his, the fingers up to eye level, inspected them, and once satisfied, placed his hand in the pocket of his jacket. There had not been any dust on them. There couldn't have been, for maids knew that all of all the furniture in the house, it was his desk that required the most careful attention. The stacks of papers and files on the right side were painfully neat, and the jar of ink on the left sat on a white napkin that had absorbed the four or five drops of black that he had spilled on the pen, uh, from the pen during the night's work. The pen sat on the wood next to the jar, um, and even from across the room, Hannah could see the lamplight dancing over its polished gold surface. A small group of documents sat in the center of the desk, and the accounts and registers he had been working on this day, permits to sign, notices to send, all of which she knew bore the same ultimate meaning, to be transformed by him into money, money which would be ultimately transformed into land, which would eventually become oil, which would become stocks, which would become offers to sell and buy sitting on his desk, which he would transform back into money, which he would send flying back into the world after tucking a generous amount into his bank account. All of this is my way of saying the cartographers of the day were wrong. Any map they drew of America would be incomplete if there was not, sitting in the center with, a desk, uh, with the rest of the country sitting out, and his father's desk. He had been sitting there working as diligently as ever when he, she'd entered the room with her suitcase in her hand and had not looked up as she placed it on the floor. I know I did not leave the door open, he said, and I did not hear you knock, which means you have entered without permission. His voice was as motionless as a loaded rifle. I'm going to San Francisco to search for mother, she'd said. You are not, he said, without taking his eyes from the pages. He dipped his pen into the ink and with a flick of his wrist signed a document that would eventually transfer 200 acres of Texas forest into his possession. I hope you won't bother me with such a ridiculous idea. You may leave now. With, this, with these words, the rifle was both loaded and cocked, still without a hint in his voice that he was talking to anything other than air. It's my decision to make. If you want to stop me, you'll have to lock me in my room. If you do that, I'll climb out the window or break down the door. I'm going. He rubbed his temple and muttered to something to himself before standing up and beginning to walk. When he stopped and met her gaze, the look in his eyes was something Achilles might have worn before battle. 
blood hungry, coal black in the shadows. If you were born far back enough in the past that such speculations were meaningful, where would this man have stood compared to Alexander? Uh, it is difficult to say, though I'm always a fan of taking the over. It is easier to say what he could, would be if born in our 21st century, that is, probably something very similar to his role in the 19th, though instead of oil, he would trade electric information. Instead of a desk, he would make his deals from a phone as he sipped cocktails in a private jet. Instead of America, he would hold around in the world. To most of the planet's people, he would exist in the same way gravity existed in the pre-Newtonian days, or perhaps smallpox. Those who knew him personally would think, think of him like a god source or angel from a fantasy novel, someone who only had to flick his wrist to make mighty kings kneel. These are small, almost insignificant changes to his role in the history, but they are nevertheless modifications. In only one facet of his existence, only one person's view, only in his dealings with his daughter would he remain entirely unchanged. He would stare at her with the same faithful eyes now as he did then, and speak the same words. What inspired this nonsense? Hannah flinched at the words, but the anger she was expecting didn't burst through. He was not quite ready. Don't fire until the see you see the whites of their eyes. I saw a vision in a dream, she said. She knew the answer would be insufficient. Out of all the responses she could have given, none of which would have been enough to satisfy, it was perhaps the most likely to ignite his fury. A dream, he said, and the rifle fired. His blow struck her before she saw him move, knocking her off her feet. It seems impossible to us that he could cross such a distance that there was between them in such a short time, and, and impossible that a man who sat at his desk all day could have such strength. But her father's vicious power was no surprise to her. He spoke, and a second later, her head cracked against the floor next to her suitcase, and she was unable to recover before the, before the tip of the shoe punched into her stomach. He kicked, and then kicked again. He knelt down and slammed her face, face with his fist, and he only had the briefest moment to think that this was the last, first time that he had ever hit her face, the first time he had hit in a place where the mark would be visible, before he lifted her up and slammed her back into the floor and all the wind was knocked out of her. He did not stop as she curled into a fearful ball, did not stop when blood splattered his floor and shoe, did not stop when bone crunched under his toes. He only stopped out of surprise, not mercy, when her hand reached out and clutched the cuff of his pants. Perhaps it was only by luck or instinct that she was able to grab him. Whether it was one of those or something else, the intervention of God, I am certain that what she did next was the prefiguration of all their actions to come. The world should have shuddered when she did it. Because as soon as she felt that cloth in her hand, she pulled, and he fell without even a cry of surprise. And even with her eyes closed tight, she knew what happened next by the sound of his head, by the sound his head made as it collided with the floor. She rose to her feet, legs shaken, uh, shaking, ribs broken, and looked at her father. Blood ran down the back of his scalp as he attempted to push himself up again. Before he could recover, she seized the suitcase next to her and with one desperate swing of her arm, connected its corner with the top of his skull, sending him reeling face down back to the ground. One arm weakly pushed against the floor, but he no longer had the strength to support of his body and collapsed. Hannah watched him crawl forward. He was moving towards his desk. Did he think he would find something there to save him? Ah, uh, she thought, that's right, I know what it is. She moved to the desk, opened every drawer, and, and found a small revolver. After checking that yes, it was indeed lo loaded, she pressed it against her father's head. She did not pull the trigger. All the strength and hate she'd felt moments ago was gone. Now there was only weariness. She could not bring herself to kill this man because she suddenly realized that his life no longer mattered to her. She was leaving for San Francisco tonight. She would never see him again. He was irrelevant. It made her laugh to think that, uh, to think that a long, joyful laugh filled with more happiness than she could remember. She stepped back towards the door and watched him roll himself onto his back. He sat on the floor, leaning against the desk to look at her. And anger was gone from his eyes. Hannah did not recognize the emotion this, in those two lightless holes. Well, he said, run then. The words were slurred. His hair all of his face was covered in blood. It leaked down to stain his shirt and the desk and the floor under him. It seemed possible, thought Hannah, that he would die no matter what else she did. Run to your fucking death, he said. I know what lies out there, girl. I know what that city is. Lawlessness and death. A weak girl, he trailed off. For the first time in his life, words did not come to him. He gritted his teeth, felt several broken ones in his straw, and forced himself again to speak. A world like uh, a girl, weak girl like you won't last seven days in the West. Yes, said Hannah, a weak girl wouldn't, but your daughter might. She left her father bleeding for the maid to find in the morning. We all must not be too hasty to label it a miracle that she was able to descend the stairs of her house, still holding the revolver, and limp out onto the road and walk two miles down the road into the city in the uh, dead of night. How could we after what she had just accomplished? How could we without diminishing what was to come? And that's the first part of the story. The rest of the story is in the magazine, um, the first chapter of it, that is. 
and it's hopefully going to be a novel link thing that I'm working on. So if you're interested in that, there will be more to come. That's it. Wow. What a cliffhanger. <laughs> I'm actually really, I've been looking forward to the zine because, um, Griffin has read some great pieces, yeah. read a great piece that was going to be in it, and someone else whose name escapes me right now. ARD, uh, that's probably what he went by, a random day. Yes, yep, yeah. yes. We had a really great, uh, I think, piece of poetry, yeah. like, yeah, like satirical, like Heinlein poetry from it. Yeah. I'm really excited about this thing, and listening to your piece only made me more excited, so I'm definitely going to have to yeah. check I'm, it uh, out. I'm glad to hear out. it. Yeah. Um, uh, it should drop Monday. Um, it's basically almost finished. Um, oh, yeah. We just need to get a couple other things together and then February 1st. And um, yeah, I'm glad you're excited. I hope everyone enjoys it. Thank you for letting me read this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for reading. And if you or Griffin could shoot me the link when it drops, I'll make sure that it, I uh, post it on the Misery Tourism Twitter account. Yeah, should I just send it to the Twitter? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can just DM it to, or you can just, if you're going to tweet it out, um, just uh, tag Misery Tourism in there and I'll make sure I okay. give it a signal boost. Sounds good. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. thank you so much for reading. Yeah, thank you. Um, was there anyone else who had, Rudy, did anyone else say they wanted to read? I haven't been following the chat too closely. Uh, I don't think so. I didn't see anybody else in there. But if you do, uh, just jump in. Now's the time. Well, I'm just, I need to use the bathroom. So oh, Derek, I'm Derek. Five minute break something. here. If anyone wants to read, just say so while I'm gone and then we'll, we'll pick up. I'll be back. Oh, I was going to say something, but he records it here, doesn't he? Whenever he goes to the bathroom. Oh, yeah, it's man. still recording. I should, now. <laughs> I should pay attention to that. He doesn't have video editing software. Uh, I don't know what he's edited, actually. Are you implying he would do work? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't edit video, Derek. Oh, you, oh video's just... Oh, all right. We're all just going to stay quiet till he comes back and turn off the recording. <laughs> no, Malay, you're going to answer the question for me, okay? Oh, God. <laughs> all right, here's the question. A little bit longer old thing that I need to edit and figure out what the fuck, or some new ranty thing. What's your, what's your vibe there? Oh... I kind of liked, like, we, we had the tank museum, and we had the, the, well, the really good one about whooping Batman. I really like ranty ones right now. I'm feeling it. All right, all right. Honestly, I feel the rant, too. I know the question wasn't directed at me, but I, I feel the rant. We love the rant. Rant. Excellent. I'm only I'm only bummed that the Bible's left that he knocked off. I've left some Easter eggs in this room. Was was he talking about you in that yeah. one? Were you the Derek? Baby oh, Derek. Oh God, I hope not. <laughs> um, maybe. Or you know what, John? The other thing I could do is I could read my review of Body High. No, I don't um, read that, <laughs> that, that I talked about that I talked about before you came on because I didn't want to embarrass you while you're on but um, now I've decided to uh, it it was incredible man you you really really wrote like a special fucking novel I loved it there you go uh, thank you my god I'm blushing no that's you're just Irish like Scott Irish some sort of that's true yeah, we uh, we can't hide our own. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, we're made a little red. I think you are the baby, Derek.
Yes, uh, yes, there, but I think I probably am. I'm at an Airbnb. I was spending the weekend with my son, like on a little trip, but it's just like a condo thing. But I have two, so I travel for work sometimes and I have a, a work account, right? But then I have a second Airbnb account that I allow as a guest to get down to like two stars so that I can smoke weed and Airbnbs and trash and stuff. And I'm at, I'm using this account, that particular account for this Airbnb. I feel like I missed a really good story. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Rudy, did anyone? Um, uh, yeah, Derek is up, I believe, next. Oh, awesome. Derek. Garrett liked him unhinged, too. A lot of people want to meet, admit this, or I don't know, maybe I'm projecting a bit but it's not often discussed. Garrett was a fairly lazy writer. He knew he lacked imagination and that's part of what I think drew him to the program. This whole supremely narcissistic idea that your writing can be done without you having to do anything or eventually even exist. And that also drew him to very unhinged characters in his life. He just mined their eccentricities for content. Fallon was perfect for GF in this sense. Oh yeah, Fallon was a fucking wild man. Found got arrested once for indecent exposure. Had to register and everything. He was at the house show. This must have been 1999 or 2000. A band was playing in the living room. Found pulls out his dick and starts masturbating. Garrett wasn't there. G Garrett didn't even know Found then. Found wasn't a critic and Garrett was barely a writer. 20 years later, Garrett writes name and date of birth and places it in Scab magazine. Perfect, right? And it's just a total fucking retelling of Fallon jerking off in the living room. <laughs> Except, God, I love this part. Fallon can't say shit about it. What's he going to do? Um, excuse me, but that first person story you wrote about a guy jacking it in front of a bunch of people and then getting arrested, you can't use that because like, that's what I did. That's me. <laughs> and hell no. He kept his mouth sewn. His record had been expunged. He wasn't knocking door to door, introducing himself in the neighborhood pedo anymore. There's no way he was piping up. Fallon did not ever review that story. <laughs> no, he did not. No, he did not. Another Fallon story, quite illustrative of the qualities of the man. One night, he's pretty deep in his cups at Gatsby's, the shitty Coke bar where a fourth and trade split. What he's doing there at that place, in that town, at that hour, God, I don't even want to imagine. Creepy. He's drunk enough where he doesn't recognize Thomas Pearl, who is sitting alone in a booth, looking a little disheveled, but still professional through and through. Thomas is kind of joking around in the beginning, asking Fallon what he does for work and whatnot, figuring that you know, the jig would be up quickly. They'd share a laugh, and, you know, talk about the in the avant-garde scene. They didn't really call it that anymore, where the trends were starting, but, but not where the awards were being given out. Well, pretty soon it's clear to Thomas that Fallon isn't fucking around. He really doesn't know who he is. They've never met before, and sure, editors, even editors with the kind of access and clout Thomas had don't get their photos on book jackets, but it's a small scene, and Thomas has been to plenty of readings, shaken plenty of hands, so he's really rather surprised. Not hurt, I wouldn't say. His ego is bruised. He just didn't expect it at all. 20, 30 minutes into the conversation, and Fallon starts name-dropping Garrett. Well, Thomas just keeps up the act. He asks questions, plays dumb. Fallon starts taking a little credit. Oh, he's easily egged on, Fallon. It doesn't take much. Thomas has him so riled up, he starts banging the table and muttering, I picked him. No one ever mentions that. He's great, sure, but there's hundreds of them. You don't even have to dig that far to find the warm bodies of great unknown writers. It doesn't matter if you're unknown. If you're unknown, you don't exist. You never did. I picked him. Whatever, read him at the right time, reached out, wrote a little about him here and there. Drop his name. Hey, Garrett Frame, that Garrett Frame guy. He's got a new story out. Maps and Micro and Mac were the first person narrators, the son of abusive father, and has to decide whether to rat him out and save his mother. Have you read the guy? He was nice to me. He treated me like an equal, and a lot of them don't do that. You know, They see a critic and they think, oh, this guy's a glorified book reviewer. What the hell does he know? And figure the talent just passed me by. Hard luck. That's how the cookie crumbles, but not Garrett. He was my friend, I thought. I doubt it happened like that or at all. It's probably apocryphal, but that doesn't mean anything. It means it's more true, actually. 
because apocryphal stories have more than one author. They're told orally over a long span of time by countless people, all kinds of people. So they get sanded out, smoothed out, perfected as a story. Apocryphal stories hit their target every time. They are working stories. They come in with a purpose, a mission. There was a reading in New York right before the failures. A big deal, star studded. It was Brooklyn, it was that big of a deal. Cold beer, smokes, poets. At an old meat locker turned co-op slash bakery performance space. Outside, while the first band was setting up, before the reading started, a smattering of overheards. Doc is supposed to stop by. Have you seen Claire? I heard she moved to Queens. Where's Queens? The new Playboy Cardi is dope as fuck. I met Doc at AWP. Have you heard Garrett read? Do they sell booze here or just beer? Rockstar made. Dude, this is a one-hitter quitter. He gets naked. What? Yeah, when he reads, he, um, well, I mean, not right at the start. It's not a strip tease. He just, he says he gets sweaty, so the shirt always comes off, and act one, guaranteed. Then, when the piece is really rising, he's got a real emotional timber to his work, wouldn't you say? A spurt just overtakes, and he claims he can't help it. You have to sort of believe it to see it, but it's real. Act three, he is completely naked, spittle flying through the crowd, guttural, animalistic, but no one minds because he has the most beautiful cop. Listening to himself read aloud is a major turn on for him. He gets himself very hard. And it's so smooth, base to tip. You know, it's funny. He's got these disgusting hands, skin always peeling. What is it, discotic eczema, he insists. Open sores, cracks everywhere, pus, blood. You'd never expect such smooth cock skin but the whole sleeve is gorgeous. It kind of shines, like when the stage light hits it just right, when he's, when he's reading, his cock glistens. He never comments on it. Doesn't break the fourth wall, doesn't break character, if it's even a character, who knows which he, uh, when he finishes in front of everyone, he just gathers his papers, gives a little halfway bow of thanks for the applause and gets dressed, comes down, shakes hands, hugs folks, like nothing, but he has to know what his cock does to people, the sight of it, the thread of it, so full and pink. Fallon is there. In a few minutes, they're actually going to meet for the first time, GF and Fallon, unless I had them meet for the first time somewhere else in the narrative, in which case this is the second time that they meet. That's not important. This is what's important. The buzz was fucking real at this thing. Doc was there. Publishers, expat, Vlad, 1111, Misery, Tyrant. Kids passing out manuscripts, like passing notes in homeroom. The scene was so thick. L dog. GF wasn't the headliner. People were still pretending to like Redacted until the actual death of the author. But GF wasn't some unknown. Several people came just to see him read. Whether they actually liked his work or just wanted to get close enough to almost touch it, I can't say. And yet, and yet, picture this. Fallon walks up to a small group of Vitaly bros smoking cloves out front. He's got his till pressed shorts on, white crew Nike socks, black dress shoes, scuffed, sloppy motherfucker, still screamed money. Just didn't have a clue how to spend it. Did you know he had a trust fund? Oh yeah, that's what I heard. Like I said earlier, bitch made, climber, super messy. Joy Division cover, like the shirt, the cover of Unknown Pleasures, of course, and a ratty blazer. Dressed like he'd get down on his hands and knees and beg you to kick his ass. And actually, he didn't just dress like that. He was that. One night, I'm jumping around a little bit here. I, I'm sorry. This was a few years later when, when Fallon and GF were practically sewn together. Okay. So Fallon starts telling GF about this. I don't know if you can call it like a hobby, but a, a proclivity, okay? Well, a compulsion, nonetheless. Fallon liked to drive alone at night and drive really, really fast. Fallon liked to play his music really, really very loud and drive alone at night. And, and he liked to aim the car right at a telephone pole. Then he'd chicken out and swerve back on the road. It made him feel alive. Remember, it made him feel something, I guess. And he'd ride his ass on other cars, getting so close, he'd almost touch bumpers, flipping off these serious country boys. He really did like getting his ass kicked, got off on it. Fallon is telling all this to GF, and GF, that slippery fuck, he's just sitting there taking notes, pin shaking, he's copying down Fallon's bullshit so fast. 
Less than a month later, GF releases a new a surface last pat on XPAT, just a web thing. And it was supposedly just a transcript of Fallon spilling his secret shame backstage, obviously not expecting he was being fictionalized right in front of his eyes. But that's way down the line. Tonight, that's not important. Tonight, at the reading, this is what's important. We're inside now. GF is there. He's clinging hard to the back wall, gripping a handicap railing by the entrance ramp, getting seen but unapproachable, brilliant, classic pre-reading stance. Fallon saunters, floats across the room. The lighting is a harsh red, a band is playing now, a loud one. Mingling at the bar, no real booze, just beer, less attention from the neighborhood zoning committee is how it's explained to me. Two beautiful men making out and grabbing ass, blocking the entrance to the men's room probably playing a lookout while their friends fuck in the stall. I shouldn't assume. The band announces it's their last song. Unspoken relief pulses through the crowd, such as it was. Long-haired skinny dude working the mixer turns the house lights on, sends a shockwave through the crowd. The Batal bros enter, their clothes extinguished. Poets are filling in. The realists are buying the publishers beers, visual poets taking photographs. Maximalists huddled together in the center of the room trying to build up the nerve to speak to each other. No one is paying any attention to GF, which clammy hands heavily bandaged to hide the bus, pus, blood scars, skin shit, tightening the grip on the rail seems to be going according to plan. The amazing thing is about to happen. So much talent in that room. So many opportunities, a current, pulse, buzz, sex, promise of a cock unsheathed. And with all these disparate characters, all these fascinating people, some of them even good looking, and what starts to happen? Casually at first, then cautiously, finally a stampede. Everyone, save GF and the long-haired skinny dude working the mixer in circles, Fallon. And suddenly he's the center of attention. He's the show. GF's eyes narrowed. He was confused. Anyone would be, right? It took until later that night or maybe the next morning for Garrett to add it up. The room was filled with writers, some excellent ones even. The room was filled with publishers, the coolest ones. But Fallon did something else. Fallon sold. His words moved books. He got you read. He built the hype machine. The writers could write you a story, which the other writers would read out of a sense of obligation and a hilarious concept of community. The publishers could turn those words into physical bound things, which you could show to your ex or your teacher or your kids to prove your self-worth. All important, all just for the mill, Fallon could write your legacy. And I'm just going to stop there because I mean, I can... <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my oh, wow. God. There's, there's entirely too much to unpack there. <laughs> no, that was, that was like everything. Tonight has been everything I love about these fucking readings. And that kind of summed it all up. It was like the, the performance was incredible. That was meta as fuck. I love all the references, hidden inside references that like, like, <laughs> <laughs> it was funny it was i don't know it was great it was good it, oh my god i am tongue-tied but that was absurdly fun <laughs> to listen to. thank you thank you thank you that was really really fun to read it wasn't what i was going to read i gave i gave him the option in between i said old thing that i can't figure out how to edit or rant and she went with rant so that's where we went <laughs> well thank you malayne <laughs> And Keith says performance art in the chat, and I agree. Tonight has kind of been a night of performance art, honestly, and I, I love this shit. This is fantastic. Derek, is that going somewhere? Is that going to be posted somewhere? Uh, there are a couple references that you could probably tell, but it's part of something else that I actually have not um, been reading. Uh, but um, elements of it I've read you know, um, before. I mean, there's references to other stories that I've read. Um, you know what I mean? For instance, within the, you know, framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, just, but I was wondering, is it going to be, um, is it going to be posted somewhere? Is it going to be published somewhere? Um, not, not that, yeah, not yet that I know of. Not posted for sure. It's not, gotcha. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, love it. I want to hear more of it. <laughs> yeah. Is that a lot longer project you're working on? Yeah, it's a lot longer project. Like I, I just, while we were doing the bathroom, I scrolled up to try to find a beginning and end 
you know like that's what's tough about it is like you just kind of whatever um but yeah uh that's part of a longer project and it's like literally a cut out in the third you know third part it's exciting gotcha. it's really cool it reminded me a lot of like Bologna. that would make sense since yeah. he's yeah <laughs> He's a huge, huge inspiration. Cool. Yeah, I really, I really want to see it in print because it's one of those pieces that, like, feels dense. And I just know, like, I got some of the jokes and I got some of the references, but I know I didn't get them all. And I want to, I want to pick through it because I feel like <laughs> undiscovered pleasure is there. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, Rudy, did anyone? Where, where is your next chapter? Huh? Where is your next chapter? Well, um... where is your? <laughs> Actually, I, I love, I love, I love how your expression changed to fear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a. I'm glad that you got caught on. I actually do. I do have something I could read. Um. And read it. But read I wanted it. to give. Was there anyone else who wanted to read? <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think I saw anybody else in the chat. Okay. Um, so this is, I'll put this link in here. This is not going up on Twitter and it's not going up on Misery Tourism. Um, some of you know, I've kind of been agonizingly plugging away at something that might someday be a novel. This in my mind is a draft of what might be the first chapter of that. So the two pieces that I've published on Misery Tourism would, in this hypothetical book that would probably never exist, will come after this uh, piece that I'm going to read tonight. Um, so that said, this is, I apologize because this is pretty dry. There's a lot of like stage setting shit in it. Um, and it is very, very unfinished, but I'm going to read it nonetheless, because I'm a masochist and you're making me. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. Um, shit, how oh, long have I been muted for? Yeah, I was, I was didn't saying, hear anything. I didn't hear anything. Yeah. Didn't hear anything. I saw, I saw you start to read, but I, I thought it was just me. But yeah. You're when right. um, what was the last thing you heard me say? How long have it's I like been? Like, you just it. you just introduced the piece. Literally, yeah. just introduced the piece, and then you there was nothing. Oh, okay. No. So I I don't have to introduce the piece again. I don't have to say this no. is the first chapter. Yada yada. yada. Oh, thank oh, Christ. Okay. Good. I, I okay. So I must have started. muted it when I minimized the window to bring up the other thing. Okay. Okay. That didn't mute me again. Okay. Thank Christ. Zoom has this thing where if you're talking a lot, there'll be a pop up that says you're muted. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So this is the. Yeah, this is what I wrote. <clears throat> the young king's body was exhumed this morning before dawn in accordance with my request and was transported in secret to the home where it will be perfumed, make up and dressed so that it will be ready to stand trial. No, not in accordance with my request, in accordance with my order. I no longer have the gentle privilege of making requests. I can only give orders. It was my order that the body be removed and moved before sunrise. One of the largely interchangeable men of the court had suggested a public parade, soldiers and citizens lining the streets on all sides as the young king's remains passed by in the afternoon heat. The stink, the pageantry, the thrown fruit and vegetables, you can close your eyes and see it just as clearly as I can, not only because it's a cliche, but also because neither of us have seen it or will, or will since I did not allow it. I'm marveling now at the implied majesty, majesty of that phrase, did not allow it, as if I had been certain of my opinion before he spoke and stirred unwaveringly firm, the ruler indistinguishable from his edict. No, no, no. I hesitated, I equivocated. I said, well, I said, um, I said, I don't think so. 
I explained myself. I may possibly have stuttered. I recall a stammer. I was already awake when the servant came to tell me that the body had been disinterred. I've been waking up earlier and earlier. I'm told this is what old men do. It's normal. It has nothing to do with guilt or shame or foreboding, or at least not an abnormal amount of any of those things for a 64-year-old mind. The corpse was discreetly carried from its hilltop tomb, down the hillside facing away from the city, through a grove of olive trees. The olive is not native to the capital. Nothing seems to be. Every living thing that I've seen here is a transplant. Men, animals, trees, shrubs, probably even the mosquitoes, since they must have been lured here by the scent of human blood and sweat. Two goods that have only recently been imported, having, I imagine, been all but unheard of in the capital before capital only a generation ago. Sorry, caught a typo. <laughs> Everything is beautiful here, but it's a contrived, symmetrical sort of beauty that apes nature without surrendering to its realities. Every stream and rock and flowering plant has been carefully arranged, not so much to resemble any honest place in this world as some falsified and foggy, in all senses of the term, childhood memory, some perfectly traced outline of an imperfect truth, a cold drawing of a dead son's footprint in a field or on a beach somewhere, the footprint itself having long ago been effaced by weeds or waves. I've lost track of the thought I was chasing down. It flees faster and faster and I am unarmed. I think I was trying to explain why I hate it here in spite of myself, in spite of the work of generations upon generations of artists and monks who studied nothing but beauty and who spent countless hours, sometimes their entire lives in reflection on the science of such topics as how a stone should be placed relative to a lilac bush, what minerals in the stone would best contrast with the lilac's purple, and how thick and how green the moss on that stone should be allowed to be. All to please the eyes of the king, all to please eventually me. And yet I'm mostly bored by it, nostalgic for the frigid ugliness of the frontier. I spend my rare, quiet, solitary moments with my eyelids pressed together trying to recollect the humiliated posture of a bare oak tree after an ice storm. I was told that 12 trustworthy men were given the task of transporting the corpse, but only 11 showed up this morning. One got drunk last night and stole a neighbor's rooster. He was apprehended around midnight after accosting multiple women on the street, grabbing them by their skirts while pointing at the kidnapped fowl and punning on the shared term for its kind in his genitals. His jailer, reasonably, refused to believe that he had been given a special mission by the king. He spent the night in tears. I've been advised to have him killed or pardoned. I prefer the latter. I've ordered the latter. I was shown the jail during my victory tour of the capital. A victory won by default is still a victory, I'm assured, still honorable, still cause for tiresome pomp and ceremony, still worthy of a lunchless day of awkward procedural conversations with functionaries inside interchangeable cob buildings. And was informed then that it was almost entirely un unoccupied, the jail that is. There are some recurring inmates drunks, debtors, petty thieves, benign perverts, and so on, some of whom were quaintly recognized on sight by the guards and were generally held for a few days or weeks before being fined, flogged, publicly humiliated, or branded, and then released to recidivize. The majority of the particularly, the, sorry, the majority of the particular, particularly <laughs> vicious criminals were recruited are more likely impressed into military service during the years of war and exported to one battlefield or another to desert, die, or rehabilitate. Many others were the victims of lynch mobs in the weeks of law lawlessness immediately following the young king's suicide. I wonder, idly, if any aesthetic consideration was put into which trees to hang them from, which artificial lakes to dump their bodies into, 
the position of a heap of their burned bones relative to a hydrangea bush. The prisoner situation outside the city's walls is substantially more dire. There are thousands of men awaiting trial and or punishment. Most are either former soldiers captured by rival armies in the midst of alleged wrongdoing or imprisoned by their own commanding officers for assorted acts of disobedience and unsanctioned violence or their civilians taken and displaced after offending the sensibilities of one detachment or another. As conquered armies surrendered because of military defeat or poor luck and the war wound down, the victors were rewarded with custody of the losers prisoners, along with any of the losing soldiers whose martial acts they decided were criminal rather than simply compliant. And then the victorious armies continued their march towards the capital, bringing all their inmates with them. When they were inevitably defeated or disbanded, the process repeated itself. Eventually, many squadrons held more purported war criminals than enlisted men. By the time the war ended, most of them were encamped and ensnared within a short distance of the capital. And all of them were the responsibility of the state, my state, me. Sorry, I'm choking on my own saliva here. Villages that were evacuated or less benevolently depopulated during the war have been transformed into work camps. Emaciated men are crammed by the dozens into shanties and sod houses that once held single families. Others sleep in rows in salted fields, crudely imitating the arrangement of crops that won't grow there again for a generation, or lie on their sides in common pastures next to livestock skeletons catching flies with their mouths and attempting to satiate their hunger by chewing on browning grass. Most spend their days digging. They dig furrows so corn and wheat can be planted in fresh, uncontaminated ground. They dig trenches to reroute rivers away from beds polluted by human feces and animal corpses. They dig up bodies that have been buried in mass graves and then dig new individual graves for the remains to rest in mitigating the threat posed by restless spirits and spiteful ghosts. They dig latrines for their own ever accumulating waste. They're digging a foundation on which we can rebuild our kingdom. But likely sooner rather than later, there will be no useful holes left to dig. And all those men will be stuck entirely above ground, restlessly awaiting or dreading the time when they will be permanently below it. The crimes they've been accused of are varied and occasionally nonsensical. Desertion, treason, the, <laughs> sorry. Desertion, treason, insubordination, stealing cows, stealing kids, stealing pigs, stealing chickens, stealing dogs, rape of civilians, rape of prisoners of war, rape of a subordinate's wife, rape of a subordinate, murder, all conceivable varieties, vagrancy, fraternizing with the enemy, joining the enemy, Arson, torture, refusing quarter, defacement of flags, defacement of uniforms, defacement of faces, ransoming hostages, tainting wells, intentionally spreading the plague, intentionally spreading the pox, desecration of enemy corpses, desecration of allied corpses, desecration of civilian corpses, desecration of animal corpses, conjuring demons, concubining demon, demons, public indecency, malicious castration, Sometimes when I look at the lists of names and offenses, I forget which is which. Identity becomes indistinguishable from sin. I'm overwhelmed. There's no practical way to try them all. And even if there was, there are no natural worldly, worldly means available for determining their guilt or innocence. The witnesses to their crimes are dead, displaced, or disgraced. The soldiers responsible for their arrests are now interned with them working on the same chain gangs, drinking the same dysenteric water, and similarly, bar similarly barred from giving testimony, not to condemn their compatriots, not to save themselves. Note to self, I'm gonna start writing less things with the letter R in it because I can't pronounce it. <laughs> I'm gonna be reading this, okay. One nobleman insisted they should all be executed. It'd be cathartic in a way he offered in a gentle, affected tone that gave me the impression he thought that he was being comp compassionate. Redemptive, 
all that guilt gone, annihilated, we'd be cleaner, lighter, and then we could just move on, forward, unencumbered. The dead would be dead and the living would be innocent. I didn't scold him for the inhumanity of this proposal. Instead, I told him it wasn't practical. How many wheels we'd need to break them all? How many hammers? How many hands on the ends of unbroken wrists? And then what? You'd roll all the bodies on their wheels away somewhere beyond the horizon? It's comic. All those obliterated men on their wheels spinning out of sight off a cliff at the most distant edge of the frontier, at the limit of the known world, into a ravine with no bottom where some undiscovered subterranean monster swallows them. I'm laughing in spite of myself. God, if only, if only. But these are real people alive at this moment, alive now, and I need to make a decision. I'd like to pardon them, all of them, not because I think all or even many are innocent, but because I'm tired and I'm complicit and I'm tired of complicity. In, re in retrospect, the war has no narrative. There's no story there outside of complicity. Men egging each other on towards atrocity, endless rationalizations told to convince others, told to convince yourself, vacuous rambling chatter, then only noise. Death rattles, screams, slogans, pleas, puns, conspiracies, belches, farts, apologies, prayers, slurs. And all that noise culminates in me, meaninglessly, incoherently. I'm asking, I'm asked now to translate, knowing that whatever I say will be deceitful, will be a deceitful misinterpretation of the words I never heard. And consequently, men will die. But if I did pardon them all, there would be unrest. Hmm? Unrest? Yes, unequivocally, a novel advised. It may have been the same man who told me to execute them all, I, I can't recall. Consequence and vindictiveness are the two fundamental load-bearing pillars of human morality. Your regime might deny the people one and survive, but both, no, they... I waited awkwardly for a moment for him to continue to finish his thought before realizing that he probably felt he was disallowed from saying the rest. I wonder how vividly he would have described the revolt if he hadn't realized that doing so was tactless or treasonous. Would he have gotten as far as describing me tied to plank, splinters in the rotten wood, splinters in my geriatric back as each member of the mob approached single fire file patiently to place the heaviest stone they could lift on my chest, each hoping theirs would be the fatal one, the lucky one? Would he have, would he have pressed on, huh? Beyond that, to walk me through the process of decay my body would undergo on the gibbet, the journey from rigid to rancid and back again? Would he have listed the shades of yellow my exposed skull could be expected to exhibit between youthful white and fossilized brown? Once you start exploring certain hypotheticals, there's no simple, polite stopping point, no clear exit strategy. But on the topic of exit strategies, here's mine. We will try a corpse. We'll put the young king on trial. It was his narcissism and negligence in, in how he chose to rule and how he chose to die that precipitated all of this horror. Why should anyone else be held responsible? So we'll exhume him, done. We'll prop him up in a chair in a public square and read him his crimes. We'll let a crowd gather and scream and cry, blame and mourn, accuse and take his unwillingness to answer as an admission of guilt. We'll convict him. We'll execute him. Also done, but that's extraneous. Maybe there will be consequences for his soul. I doubt it, but certainly no one will be able to say it's not vindictive. Let me prove my capacity for vindictiveness on the dead. Then I can pardon the living. The body is secure now. No one interfered with its transport. All 12 of them, 11 living, one dead, passed unseen down the hill through the olive grove, excuse me, down the hill through the olive grove and across other terrain that appears dim in my imagination. Dim because all of this has happened in darkness and dim because I do not know the city well enough to visualize the rest. 
but regardless, it's done. I've moved to my room's window to write in the natural light. It's past dawn now. I've missed the sunrise. Oh, okay, that's it. I'm done. I'm done with that. <laughs> um, did anyone else want to read? Also, I caught a second typo that I'm going to have to try to find and fix. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this no, so bad. Can just, yeah, you can't you can't just move on. That was um, <laughs> oh, that was wow. really really good. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, that was the, palace in, the palace intrigue, like regular uh, the way you're putting like regular consciousness in, into these people, like the sort of disagreements just any two people or whatever would have in their neuroses is is really cool. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not really sure, like I said, this was, this, I started writing this before I wrote the like two chapters that I read earlier, but I finished it just like today. Um, and I think like, um, like, I don't know, I, I'm a lot, like, weird as it may sound, a lot more comfortable, like, writing internalities and externalities. Like, I'm a lot more comfortable yeah. writing within a character's mind than I am, like, seeing the world outside of it. Um, so, yeah, no, thank you for that. I really do, like, want to get at, like, the neuroses of this narrator and, like, the psychological burden of being a, like, kind of like reasonably self-aware but like like totally like somewhat self-indulgent human being and being kind of thrust into the situation where like you see the moral implications that every one of your actions ha will have on a lot of people but you're not necessarily you don't necessarily have the clarity or insight to make wise choices <laughs> um yeah um but yeah, thank thank you guys. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I love how the uh, the narrator his like you said like the internality of it, um, the way his mind is kind of like a play on like the state and like the especially the images of decay and like destruction that are in the piece. You know, like it's kind of a play on like like you don't have to speak about the state. You just know what what kind of state it is just by reading that. Mm -hmm. Just by reading like his reflection on like the uh you know you don't have to you don't have to see what kind of field you don't have to describe what kind of field state it is with its political apparatuses and any, all that kind of stuff you just know about it because of how he's speaking about it in his mind basically does that make any sense or? yeah no it does it does i think and i wanted to have this kind of piece with this kind of um like elderly ruler who's maybe in a little bit of mental decay who's like been thrust into a, into a position where the kingdom is maybe in a comparable state of like decay yeah us. um there is maybe <laughs> maybe a little bit of what's going on presently in the world maybe i'm working through that a little bit um but yeah no thank you rudy um did anyone else sign up to read, offer to read while I was um, reading? Or are we done? <laughs> uh, I didn't see anybody else. Okay, um, okay then um, last call. Does anyone want to read? No, I just wanted to say, again, I think I met, mentioned in the comments that I really liked uh, uh, there was a number of lines that I wanted to emphasize and that but the uh, the no narrative to war uh, only complicity was really good i thought so. yeah th thank you yeah thanks <laughs> i um i was a little worried in that section that maybe i was sermonizing a little too much but it was very much that particular like paragraph or whatever is very much like coming from my own frustration at the current moment maybe like the feeling of like the sort of endless um you know the kind of state of like endless like numbing deadening conflict that 
we seem to be constantly in, you know, as a society or just like, maybe I spend too much time on Twitter. I don't know, but like they're very much like um, that feeling of being co constantly feeling complicit in a um, chain of events that you don't really feel like you have much control over and that you don't really feel like you have the ability to comprehend or understand. Yeah. Um, now the, the girl boss movement is going to solve everything. <laughs> about that <laughs> thank god for girl boss, <laughs> girl boss. but uh no the feminizing is like i actually really like that kind of when done well again like kind of like the anaphora i was talking about with uh i guess with it would have been graham's uh poem earlier uh but it's like if it's a device that yeah there's a lot of room for uh, or rather there's a slim margin for error but if done well those are some of my favorite um, graphs in, um, in books that I, that, mm. that I tend to read, you know, and the early Steinbeck actually, I find often that, and it could be, it could be heavy handed moralizing or whatnot, but when done well, it's not. <laughs> and I feel like you, uh, were in the safe zone of it not being, uh, heavy handed. <clears throat> so I really liked it. And it's hard to do. It's hard to do. It's hard to do like comedy. It's hard to do. So. Yeah. I love the way Steinbeck handles that as well. Um, yeah, no. And, and I, and um, you're right, because a lot of like the authors I really love, uh, like Dostoevsky and, and as you said, Steinbeck and um, our mutual, um, an author we both love, uh, Hansen, yeah. he gets there a lot too. And he gets there in a way that feels like perceptive rather than didactic. And I think that's a really, it's a really tricky kind of thing to do once you, once you exit the sphere of um, like describing reality and enter the sphere where you have a character interpreting reality, I, I think that sometimes that, that can be a pretty like scary kind of space because you're always like how much of my own like biases and like moral ideas am I shoving in here and how much are they like maybe like um, coloring like the world I'm creating maybe a little too much but it, yeah thank you Josh um it doesn't I don't Rudy nobody else uh, offered to read huh as far as I can see okay so I think we are done with the reading portion of this as always I'm gonna after I stop recording I'm gonna leave this um Read this, leave the Zoom call open for a while. People want to hang out, bullshit, whatever. But um, yeah, that's it for the reading. Recording um, stuff, yeah. So if my guy comes by, it's fine. Like y you'll be all set once I <laughs> once I stop recording. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, this has been Misery Loves Company. Uh, it's a presentation, I guess, of miserytourism.com. If you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, maybe stop by sometime and read or listen to others read. This happens every Friday, um, 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Pacific. Just follow at Misery Tourism on Twitter and we tweet out the link 15, 10, 15 minutes before the show starts. Okay, thank you everyone who read. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rudy. <laughs> uh, did I forget anyone? I, I apologize if I forgot any. Oh, thank you, Eric. Um, so anyway, have a good night, guys. That's thank you, it. India. Thank you. Thank you.